Hello, my name is Fausto Labruto. I'm a radiologist and the chief of ultrasound at Karolinska University Hospital in Stockholm, Sweden. Today's lecture will be about regional anatomy of the neck. We will follow the classification of neck lymph node levels. And for each neck region, we will discuss the most important anatomical landmarks. And we will give some examples of pathology. Finally, we will shortly discuss the surgical procedure known as a neck dissection. Enjoy! This is a lecture about the regional anatomy of the neck. I think uh, ultrasound specialists must be familiar with uh, and the anatomy of the neck for a better identification and a description of a pathology. This is especially true when it comes to staging head and neck malignancies because the exact position of metastatic lymph nodes has an enormous prognostic value and is of great importance for planning of treatment, surgical treatment or radiotherapy. In the, the settings of lymph node pathology of the neck, the most uh, popular regional classification is the one introduced by Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, which divides the neck into six regions and uh, subregions. This uh, classification originally featured uh, seven regions. However, the seventh region is in the upper mediastinum and it doesn't belong to the neck and will not be further discussed today. During the course of this lecture, we will follow this regional classification as a road map and for each region we will define uh, the most important anatomical landmarks and we will give uh, examples of uh, pathology. We start with uh, region 1, which is actually divided into two subregions, 1A and 1B. In order to fully grasp the anatomy of this part of the neck, it is important to be familiar with the anatomy of the digastric muscle. This muscle consists of two bellies the posterior and the anterior, which are connected by an intermediate tendon. The posterior belly originates from the mastoid process of the temporal bone, while the anterior belly attaches to the body of the mandible. The intermediate tendon, which is located immediately superior to the hyoid bone, may pass anteriorly, posteriorly, or in a minority of cases, through the distal part of the stylohyoid muscle, which is a muscle that extends from the styloid process of the temporal bone to the hyoid bone. Region 1B, which is also known as the submandibular region, is limited laterally and posteriorly by the posterior belly of the digastric, anteriorly and medially by the anterior belly of the digastric, while superiorly by the body of the mandible. Region 1A, which is also known as the submental region, is on the other hand a medial region, limited laterally by the anterior belly of the digastric, inferiorly by the hyoid bone, and superiorly by the mandible. Region 1 is the drainage region for the lymphatics of the lower lip, the anterior chin, the gum, the anterior portion of the floral mouth, the tip of the tongue, and the internal facial structures. Because of the position of the mandible which will cause acoustic shadows, imaging of this part of the neck by ultrasound is mainly obtained by oblique axial and oblique coronal projections. If we place our ultrasound probe as shown in uh, this picture, we will be able to identify laterally an axial section of the belly of the sternocleidomastoid muscle. This is the muscle that extends from the mastoid process of the temporal bone to the clavicle and uh, to the manubrium sternae. More immediately, we will see an axial section of the posterior belly of the digastric muscle. Even more immediately, we will distinguish the parenchymatous structure of the submandibular salivary gland. The vessel seen between the belly of the digastric and the submandibular salivary gland is the anterior branch of the retromandibular vein. If uh, we rotate the ultrasound probe and place it more medially, as shown in this picture, we will obtain an oblique projection of the belly of the stylohyoid muscle and an almost cross-sectional projection of the intermediate tendon, 
which connect the um, posterior and anterior bellies of the digastric. Those are adjacent to the submandibular salivary gland. If we, on the other hand, uh, turn the ultrasound probe to an almost axial position, we may obtain a long image on the intermediate tendon, just caudal to the submandibular salivary gland. This is the intermediate tendon. And uh, if we turn the ultrasound probe exactly 90 degrees from the former position, on an oblique sagittal projection, we will obtain a perfect cross-sectional view of the intermediate tendon. Deep to the intermediate tendon, we will see the thin mylohyoid muscle. This is the muscle which extends from the body of the mandible to the superior aspect of the hyoid bone. And uh, together with the thicker geniohyoid, this muscle forms the muscular floor of the mouth. This shadow forming structure here is the hyoid bone seen on a sagittal projection. In uh, this image, which is obtained just slightly more medially to the former, beside the submandibular salivary gland, we observe uh, the intermediate tendon of the digastric, the mylohyoid and the geniohyoid which are just cranial to their attachments to the hyoid bone. We can also see the acoustic shadow formed by the body of the mandible. An important thing to remember when insonating this part of the neck is that besides visualizing the neck itself, we enjoy a unique view of parts of the oral cavity and even of the pharynx. This is, for example, a view of the posterior part of region 1b, where we recognize the posterior belly of the digastric, the submandibular salivary gland, and uh, the geniohyoid and the lateral part of the tongue, together with the soft tissues of the lateral pharynx. On the other side, we see an hypoechoic, uh, ill-defined mass that abuts the lateral part of the tongue. This was later shown to be a tonsillar cancer. As we mentioned before, region 1a, which is also known as submental region, is a median region. Region 1A is divided into right and left by the middle line. The difference between right and left region 1 is not just an academic one. If we think, for instance, that uh, localization of a metastatic lymph node to the right or to the left of the middle line will modify the staging of the disease and its prognosis with uh, ramifications on the surgical treatment or on uh, radiotherapy. Probably the best way to image region 1A by ultrasound is to position the probe just below the chin to obtain an exact coronal projection and move the probe dorsally and caudally down to the higher bone. This way we will be able to identify the following pairs of muscles, the anterior belly of the digastric, the thin mylohyoid and the thick geniohyoid, and above them the centrally located the hyogloss, which extends from the hyoid bone to the root of the tongue. Above these pairs of muscles so we observe the tongue, and beneath it, on both sides, the parenchymatous structure of the sublingual salivary glands. If you have difficulties at uh, identifying the tongue or the sublingual salivary glands, just ask the patient to move or to lift the tongue. In the image on the right hand side here, the patient is holding a mint uh, under the tongue on his left side, which makes the boundary between the tongue and the sublingual salivary gland uh, very distinct. And uh, this is an example of a pathologic lymph node in region 1A. As uh, usual uh, in this coronal projection with the ultrasound probe position just below the chin, we recognize the thick geniohyoid right beneath the tongue, the thinner mylohyoid and uh, the digastric, uh, the anterior belly of the digastric. This pathologic lymph node in region 1A can also be appreciated on a contrast enhanced CT scan and the coronal projection. As we mentioned when we were talking about region 1B, it is important to realize that insonating this part of the neck gives us uh, unique insights to anatomical regions that are not strictly speaking parts of the neck, but are worth being familiar with, such as the oral cavity and the tongue. 
On this coronal projection of region 1A we recognize two pair of muscles, the thin mylohyoid and the thicker geniohyoid, together forming the floor of mouth. And we recognize the acoustic shadows uh, given by the mandible on both sides. Immediately deep to the muscular floor of the mouth we observe the sublingual salivary glands and centrally the rather hypoechoic hyogloss which is uh, covered by the more echogenic mobile tongue. And on the patient's right side you may notice an ill-defined mass which abuts the mobile tongue and the right sublingual salivary gland. This was later shown to be a lingual cancer. This finding would have been very difficult to visualize on contrast enhanced the CT scan as we see on uh, this image and which is just taken uh, just one day later and uh, would be very subtle on this magnetic resonance image of the same patient obtained uh, some days later. However, it is rather obvious on ultrasound and this just confirms us how ultrasound permits exquisite soft tissue differentiation and resolution. This is yet another example of pathology of the oral cavity seen at the ultrasound of the neck. We are in region 1A, as usually it is easy to recognize the symmetrical pairs of muscle, the digastric, the mylohyoid, and the geniohyoid, and the hyogloss, as well as the mobile tongue. And in the area corresponding to the sublingual salivary gland on the patient's right side, we observe an uh, anechoic rounded mass, which was later shown to be a hemangioma of the salivary gland, compared to contrastinensed the CT image of the same patient. Other reasons for asymmetry in the floor of the mouth include iatrogenic causes. In this particular patient, the difference in uh, ecogenicity between uh, the left and uh, the right side, just deep to the mylohyoid muscle, is due to the fact that this patient has undergone hemiglossectomy, which is the surgical removal of half of the tongue, in this case the right half, and the removed muscle is replaced by fatty tissue. The hyogloss can only be identified on the left side. And these changes can be appreciated on the accompanying uh, contrast enhanced CT image. We go on to region uh, 2. Lymph nodes in this region are known uh, as uh, upper jugular lymph nodes or level 2 lymph nodes. This is the region most frequently involved by cervical uh, lymph node metastasis. Tumors of the oropharynx uh, posterior uh, oral cavity, supraglottic larynx or a parotid gland can metastasize initially to this region. Carcinomas of the hypopharynx, glottis and anterior oral cavity are also frequently metastasized into level 2 lymph nodes. This region of the neck is limited superiorly by the skull base and inferiorly by a transverse line passing through the hyoid bone and medially by the medial border of the internal carotid artery and laterally by the mar lateral margin of the belly of the sternocleidomastoid muscle. In the uppermost 2 cm of this region, lymph nodes may be located anteriorly, uh, posteriorly or uh, laterally to the internal jugular vein, but not medially, because if they are uh, located medially, they actually are located in the parapharyngeal space, which is a space of the suprahyoid neck and falls outside of this classification. From 2 cm below the skull base down to the level of the hyoid bone, however, lymph nodes can indifferently be located anteriorly, laterally, posteriorly or medially to an internal jugular vein. Here is an image of region 2 on the axial projection. The flat band-like muscular structure located superficially is the belly of the sternocleidomastoid. The vascular structures uh, located beneath are readily recognizable as the round, pulsating and non-compressible internal carotid artery and the larger, more flat and more compressible internal jugular vein. In this image you may recognize two normal lymph nodes located medially and uh, laterally to the internal jugular vein. Level 2 lymph nodes that are located posteriorly to the internal jugular vein may be a decent tweet or separated from it by a thin layer of fat. In the latter case, the lymph nodes are described as a level 2b lymph nodes. 
We move on to region 3. Lymph nodes in this region are known as the mid jugular lymph nodes or level 3 lymph nodes. This region is the first relay for uh, hypopharyngeal, uh, glottic and subglottic uh, carcinomas. Region 3 is limited uh, superiorly by a transverse line passing through the hyoid bone and uh, inferiorly by a transverse line passing through the cricoid cartilage, medially by the medial margin of either the internal or the common carotid artery and uh, laterally by the lateral margin of the sternocleidomastoid, as you can see uh, on this axial CT scan. This is what an axial ultrasound scan through region 3 will uh, look like. On the bottom of the image you will recognize a vertebral body of the cervical spine with the corresponding vertebral artery. The largest neck vessels are, as well as the sternocleidomastoid are usually readily recognizable. And then medially, at this level you will be able to identify the parenchymatous structure of the thyroid. Other important muscles in this region are the scalenus anterior, which extends from the cervical spine to the first rib, and the longus colli, which is uh, situated uh, deep in the neck, just anterior to the cervical spine from which it uh, originates and to which it attaches. This is an example of a pathologic lymph node in region 3. As uh, shown before, the most important landmarks, uh, such as the large vessels, and the sternocleidomastoid are readily recognizable. Laterally we can still see scalenus anterior, but also more laterally to it the scalenus medius, which too extends from the cervical spine to the first rib. And in the middle of the figure an enlarged centrally necrotic lymph node, which was later shown to be metastasis of uh, squamous cell cancer of the hypopharynx compared to the axial CT image on the same area in this particular patient. Further down in the same region, almost at the border with the more caudal region 4, and always keeping yourselves on an axial projection, you may observe a very thin muscle which runs from the middle line to the side, and um, as opposed to all the other muscles which are rather more vertical in their orientation. This muscle is the homohyoid, which is circled in green here, and there is a, it is an interesting muscle which we will also encounter when we will discuss region 5. Similarly to the digastric, this muscle consists of uh, two bellies, the superior and the inferior, which are connected by an intermediate tendon. The homohyoid extends from the hyoid bone to the scapula. You can see it in this axial CT scan as well. By turning the ultrasound probe 90 degrees, we will obtain an oblique sagittal view of the homohyoid as it passes transversely between the internal jugular vein and the sternocleidomastoid. We carry on to region 4. Lymph nodes in this region are known as lower jugular lymph nodes or liver four, level 4 lymph nodes. The drain the infraglottic region, the thyroid gland, and the cervical esophagus. Carcinomas of the anterior tongue and the non cervical tumors, such as uh, non cervical esophagus, lung, or breast and stomach, may also occasionally metastasize the region uh, 4. This region is still limited uh, superiorly by a transverse line passing through the cricoid cartilage and inferiorly by the clavicle and medially by the medial margin of the common carotid artery and laterally by the lateral margin of the sternocleidomastoid as we can see on this uh, axial CT scan. This is a view of region 4 on axial projection. Between uh, the common carotid artery and the internal jugular vein it is possible to make out the outline of the vagus nerve. The fatty area comprised between uh, the neurovascular bundle the sternocleidomastoid and the scalenus anterior uh, is the part of region 4 where lymph nodes are usually located. And uh, this is an example of a large pathologic lymph node in region 4. As usual we, we uh, identify the carotid artery, the thyroid and the sternocleidomastoid. The muscle which runs uh, superficially to the thyroid is the sternohyoid, which extends from the hyoid bone to the manubrium sternae. 
and the internal jugular vein is pressed by this metastatic lymph node as we can also see on the corresponding CT scan. By turning the ultrasound probe 90 degrees we obtain an oblique coronal view of this region in the same patient. The pathologic lymph node is seen immediately superior to the clavicle but deep to the sternocleidomastoid and deep to the internal jugular vein. The shadows on the lower part of this image are caused by the transverse processes of the vertebras of the cervical spine and uh, we can uh, also observe uh, the scalenus uh, anterior muscle. This is another typical feature of region 4, following the scalenus anterior more caudally. Consistently you will observe an artery riding over its belly. This is uh, the transverse cervical artery and is a branch of the thyroglossal trunk which originates from the subclavian artery. In this view we also recognize the homohyoid muscle crossing the neck in between the internal jugular vein and the sternocleidomastoid just as we saw when we were discussing region 3. This is the scalenus anterior. And in region 5 we observe what corresponds to the area that surgeons like to call the posterior triangle of the neck and includes, includes both the spinal accessory and uh, transverse cervical lymph node chains. Solidary lymph node metastases are infrequent in this level uh, except in case of uh, nasopharyngeal cancer and uh, posterior neck skin cancer. In contrast, level 5 nodes are commonly involved in uh, lymphoma. Region 5 has a triangular shape and is limited anteriorly by the lateral margin of the sternocleidomastoid and posteriorly by the anterior margin of the trapezius muscle which is the muscle that extends from the occipital bone and the cervical and thoracic spine down to the scapula as you can see from this uh, axial MR image and region 5 is actually uh, subdivided in two subregions 5A superior to a transverse line passing uh, through the cricoid cartilage and region 5B which is inferior to the same line this is a transverse uh, section of uh, region 5B. We recognize the thyroid, the basilar bundle, the sternocleidomastoid, the, the scalenus anterior, the homohyoid, and the sternohyoid muscles, and uh, laterally the trapezium. The anterior limit of this region is represented by an oblique line touching uh, the lateral margin of the sternocleidomastoid and uh, the lateral margin of the scalenus anterior. The posterior limit is represented by a transverse line touching the anterior margin of the trapezium. If you have troubles at identifying the trapezium, think, think about it as the most lateral of the muscles of the neck and remember that uh, it always has a pointy medial margin which you can also appreciate on this uh, axial MR scan. The muscle that lies medially to it is the levator scapulae which extends from the cervical spine to the scapula. This muscle is usually easy to recognize thanks to its uh, concave shaped medial margin where the concavity sort of uh, accommodates the lateral margin of the scalenus medius. You can appreciate uh, this uh, same uh, concavity on this uh, axial uh, MR scan. And the muscle that lies uh, deep to all the mentioned muscles is the splenius colli, which is the muscle uh, which originates in the cervical spine and attaches to the thoracic spine. So, for instance, uh, in this particular patient uh, we identify a superficial lymph node on the lateral neck. We notice it uh, as laying between the lateral margin of the sternocleidomastoid and uh, the medial margin of the trapezius and uh, this uh, uh, is a level 5 lymph node. Beneath it we, have, uh, we will recognize from medial to lateral the scalenus anterior, the scalenus medius, and the levator scapulae with its uh, peculiar concave 
medial margin. When uh, scanning uh, region 5 on an axial projection, uh, we will encounter a thin muscle that runs uh, almost uh, transversely, as opposed to all other muscles running in a more or less craniocaudal direction. This muscle is the homohyoid, which we have seen crossing region 3, passing below the sternocleidomastoid, and now we see it continuing through region 5 on its way to the scapula. This is the sternocleidomastoid, this is the external jugular vein and the internal jugular vein, and this is the transversely oriented homohyoid. These surgeons uh, like to divide the posterior triangle of the neck into a superior and an inferior part, and um, they use the homohyoid muscle uh, as uh, a line uh, dividing these two triangles. As you can see from uh, this uh, image, while uh, the jugular, uh, the internal jugular vein passes deep to the homohyoid muscle, the external jugular vein passes superficial to it. This can also be appreciated on the corresponding uh, CT scan. We move on to region 6, which uh, similarly to region 1A is a median region, which is divided into left and right by the middle line. This region is uh, limited uh, superiorly by the hyoid bone and uh, inferiorly by the manubrium sterni and uh, laterally on both sides by the medial margin of the, either the common or the internal carotid artery as we can see from uh, this uh, axial CT scan at the level of the larynx. Lymph nodes in this region uh, drain uh, the supra and infraglottic regions, the piriform sinuses, uh, the thyroid gland and the esophagus. The most conspicuous structures in this part of the neck are the thyroid gland. The thyroid gland uh, and the parathyroid gland have, however, been sufficiently discussed in other lectures and we will not dwell upon them uh, any longer today. This is a sagittal scan uh, just immediately off the midline. We will see two large areas of shadows caused by air in the larynx, superiorly, and the air in the trachea, inferiorly. You may recognize the tracheal rings uh, causing uh, shadow artifacts as well. Similarly, because of the shadows that they project, you will be able to identify the hyoid bone superiorly and the thyroid cartilage inferiorly. More superficially, you will notice muscles extending from the hyoid bone to the thyroid cartilage, which is the thyrohyoid muscle and extending from the thyroid cartilage down to the sternum, the sternothyroid muscle. If we look more on the detail, uh, we will obtain a precise view of the muscles attaching to the hyoid bone, superiorly the geniohyoid and the mylohyoid, and uh, inferiorly the thyrohyoid and the sternohyoid, which is more superficial. As you can see from the accompanying MR image, the resolution of ultrasound allows for a far more detailed view of the anatomy of this part of the, the body. A typical pathology of this part of the neck is a thyroglossal duct cyst. This is an image of a sagittal image of a normal hyoid bone with the muscle attachments. This is the uh, hyoid bone and the uh, muscle attachments are superiorly the geniohyoid and malohyoid and uh, inferiorly the sternohyoid and the thyrohyoid. And uh, this is uh, an uh, accompanying MR image. And uh, this is uh, an image of a sagittal neck with uh, a thyroglossal duct cyst in the middle. The hyoid bone and the muscles are the same as in the uh, comparing case and uh, the hypohechoic uh, mass uh, located just beneath the hyoid bone is a thyroglossal duct cyst. Surgery for removal of this kind of cysts uh, often include the, the surgical removal of the body of the hyoid bone and this is an example of an image after the removal of the body of the hyoid bone. The normal shadow given by the body of the hyoid bone is uh, gone.
and uh, this area is replaced by a scar tissue. We will now briefly discuss the surgical procedure known as a neck dissection, which is aimed at controlling a neck lymph node metastasis. This uh, technique was uh, first described at the beginning of the last century by surgeons of the Cleveland Clinic, and uh, it originally featured the, the surgical removal of all the lymph nodes on the side of the neck affected by the malignancy, that is, uh, all the lymph nodes from level 1 to level 5, together with the spinal accessory nerve, the internal jugular vein, and the sternocleidomastoid muscle. The reason for removing the structures is that uh, these structures are intimately connected to the lymph node chains. And according to the American Academy of Otolaryngology and Head and Neck Surgery, this version of the procedure is defined as a radical neck dissection. However, there exist uh, today less uh, demolitive variants of this uh, procedure. We see them uh, listed here. The modified radical neck dissection is um, a procedure uh, that includes the removal of all ipsilateral lymph nodes in region 1 to 5, but the preservation of one or more non-lymphatic structures. The selective neck dissection, which is a technique of cervical lymphadenectomy with the preservation of one or more lymph node groups that are routinely removed in, removed in radical neck dissection. That's, for instance, for oral cavity cancers, a lymphadenectomy of region 1 to 3, uh, for oropharyngeal, uh, hypopharyngeal and laryngeal cancers, a lymphadenectomy of regions 2 to 4. And um, in some cases, the surgeon will want to extend the area of resection, and, uh, for example, to lymph node stations uh, of the contralateral side, and this is uh, defined as uh, extended neck dissection. And uh, this is uh, what uh, a axial ultrasound scan uh, looks like on a patient who has uh, undergone radical neck dissection. As you can see, the sternocleidomastoid and the internal jugular vein, uh, which are readily identifiable on uh, the right-hand side, uh, cannot be uh, identified on the left side. They are surgically removed. There is also some uh, scar tissue, uh, which is common in a patient uh, who have undergone uh, this kind of operations, and this could also be appreciated uh, on the corresponding uh, CT scan. And ultrasound has a major role in the follow-up of patients who have undergone neck dissection uh, with the purpose of uh, ruling out uh, relapsing uh, disease. Any lymph node identified in a region where uh, lymphadenectomy was performed, uh, regardless of uh, the size of the lymph node, should be suspected of relapsing disease and should be further examined, for example, with a biopsy. Well, uh, this concludes our lecture on uh, regional anatomy of the neck. I hope you enjoyed it and I wish you a good day.